Resident Evil and Resident Evil is my favorite Resident Evil, except for Resident Evil 4. Oh, you pervert! With slow, methodical exploration, cool weapons and gore, cerebral inventory management, shockingly good voice acting, Stop it! Don't open that door! and plenty of creepy crawlies, there's a reason people still love this game and see it as one of the best in the genre. While Silent Hill certainly beats it in terms of scares and later games in the series pumped up the action, the original Resident Evil continues to stand out because it's a pure, undiluted survival horror experience. You're stuck in a spooky mansion with monsters, there's some guns and ammo lying around, and if you're lucky, there's a bit of a story to uncover. It can be tough, unforgiving in its mechanics, and frustratingly hands off. But once it all clicks, you'll wish more games challenged you in the way this one does. I love this game, and if you give it a chance, I think you might too. But which version to play? And what about Remake? Well, fear not Poindexter, because I'm here to walk you through my favourite versions of the original and Remake, while giving you some spoiler free tips on how to enjoy yourself. So put your shades on and smoke them if you got them, because we're about to get freaky deaky in the world of survival horror. With so many re-releases, director's cuts, digital downloads and HD remasters, trying to figure out which version you should play can be a little tricky. But before we get into all that, I want to talk about the much beloved GameCube remake from 2002, and why I think it's a must play, but not a total replacement for the PlayStation original. For starters, there's a mood and a charm to the old game which just wasn't carried over to the GameCube. The mansion has these rich colours and psychedelic wallpapers which remake ditched for a more overtly sinister atmosphere. Character and weapon models have this big chunky action figure aesthetic, and of course, the corny low budget FMVs give the game a great B-movie spirit. Bizarre murder cases have recently occurred in Raccoon City. There are outlandish reports of families being attacked by a group of about 10 people. Victims were apparently eaten. But most importantly, it's worth playing the original first, because a remake actually plays upon your knowledge of the old game, to freak you out, shake things up, and have you second guessing your own decisions while also tying up all the loose ends of the original. I really couldn't say which one I like more. Both the old and the new perfectly complement each other, and considering the relatively short length of an average playthrough, I definitely think they're both worth finishing. But I get it man, you're a busy guy. Time is money and you can't afford to play both scenarios in the original and in the remake. That's why, if you're playing both of these for the first time, I recommend playing Jill's scenario in the original, and then Chris's in the remake. Jill's story is generally thought of as the easier of the two, and by beating her scenario on the PlayStation, you'll come swinging into Remake ready to tackle the challenges of Chris's campaign and the extra horrors of the GameCube version. That also means you'll get to meet Rebecca in Remake, and she makes it all worth it, brother. Oh, what was that? My interpretation is off a little. So now you're ready to jump into the original. But which version of the original? Well, to make things easy for you, there's really only two big versions we need to talk about. The Director's Cut re-release for PlayStation 1, and the modded Japanese PC port for Windows 98. Myself, I'm a fan of the Director's Cut. It's got some extra goodies like an arrange mode with new camera angles and costumes, but most importantly it features the same difficulty and auto-aim as the original Japanese release. The first release of the game we got in the West actually ditched the auto-aim, reduced the number of save ribbons, and made enemies a lot tougher. Capcom most likely made these changes to steer Westerners into buying the game instead of just renting it. This trend was fairly common for Japanese games in the 80s and 90s, since video game rentals were all the rage in the West, but illegal in Japan. The logic was that a Western customer would be more likely to actually buy the game if it was too hard to beat as a weekend rental. Pretty rude if you ask me. Regardless, I think these changes mess with the balance a bit too much, and new players should definitely be using auto-aim. So, stick with the director's cut, which has the original Japanese difficulty. And I do mean the director's cut, not the DualShock director's cut, which replaces all the old music with an arguably inferior new soundtrack. Some of it's actually alright, but there are tracks like the fart music in the basement, thanks to some misplaced sound fonts. <laughs> Thankfully, the good version of the director's cut is the one you'll find on PS3, PSP, and Vita through the PSN store. That store is not going to be around for much longer, but given how easy it is to soft mod those consoles, well, I'm sure you can figure something out. If you're using an emulator, I highly recommend using DuckStation. 
setting the resolution to 2x or 3x and enabling PGXP geometry correction so Chris no longer looks like he just ate a lemon. The only thing I don't like about this release is the fact that it still censors some of the gory parts of the opening FMV, despite what it says on the box. That's about it though, and there are a few patches out there which restore all of the gore and smoking of the Japanese version. It really is just in the first 5 minutes of the game though, so if you can't be bothered, I recommend just watching the full colour FMV on YouTube in all its shitty glory. Aside from that, the director's cut for PS1 is how I like to play Resident Evil, and if that's the route you're taking, I think you'll have a great time. But there is one other version definitely worth talking about. Back in 1999, Resident Evil was re-released exclusively in Japan for Windows 98 as Biohazard Ultra 2000. There was an earlier PC port released in the West for Windows 95, but don't get that confused with this later Japanese version by MediaKite. The reason we're interested in the MediaKite version is because of the Resident Evil Classic Rebirth patch. This patch makes the game run on modern hardware, adds support for all sorts of controllers, and it features the ability to skip door animations and perform a quick turn. The option to skip door animations is a really cool addition. I've played through these old Resident Evil games many times before and I can honestly say these animations only really bother me when it comes to going upstairs. But for all you attention deficit zoomers out there, this might be a lifesaver. The quick turn ability is something that should have been there right from the start, and considering every other Resident Evil game including Remake features this mechanic, I don't think it screws up the balance at all. On top of all that, the character models have also been fixed, so they no longer clip when walking around. For a character like Chris, whose arms constantly pop out of his sockets, I think this is a big improvement. So while this PC port with the classic rebirth patch is definitely a fine way to play the game, I still think playing the PS1 director's cut with a nice emulator like Duck Station is probably the way to go for most people. For starters, unless you're already decently cheeky at finding stuff online, the Japanese media kite version can be much harder to find online compared to just downloading a PlayStation ISO. I'd tell you where to download it myself, but I think my parole officer might be watching. The PC version also can't be used with something like a nice CRT filter, and the FMV files are noticeably shittier unless you download the high quality movie pack. But worst of all, Jill's scenario doesn't use ink ribbons for saving. This is a big part of the game's challenge, and basically giving the player unlimited saves definitely hurts the tension and balance of the game. I think that really sucks, and I have no idea why this version of the game features that change. So when you stack all that against the ability to skip doors and do a little quick turn, the PlayStation Director's Cut is still the winner in my mind. But up to you. Before we move on to talking about Remake, I do want to give a little love to two other great versions of the game that aren't as accessible as the Director's Cut. The Saturn version features a new enemy and boss battle, slightly different character models, the harder difficulty from the Western release, and a battle mode that's very similar to the Mercenaries mode from other games in the series. But it is on the Saturn, it's mad expensive, and Saturn emulation still has a long way to go. This version is more of a cool alternative for weirdos like me who already love the game. Deadly Silence for the DS has some new gameplay situations and a lot of very corny touchscreen minigames. But if you ditch the Rebirth mode and instead stick to Classic mode, this is a very faithful version of the game which you could bring to Grandma's house. The backgrounds are noticeably uglier, but all the voice acting and FMVs are here, it's got the quick turn mechanic, you can skip the door animations, and best of all, it puts the map on your top screen, which is just great. I really like this version, and if you prefer portables to consoles or PCs, this is just as good as playing the PlayStation version on something like a Vita. Ah! Jill. Barry, I didn't mean to get you that excited. Right. Anyway, you should read this. Now on to Remake. And don't worry, because you really can't go too wrong with this one. If you're playing the GameCube version on original hardware or a Wii, I recommend hooking it up to a CRT so that everything blends together nicely with the pre-rendered backgrounds. If you'd prefer to emulate in higher resolution with the controller of your choice, Dolphin does a great job as usual, and I couldn't find any issues worth mentioning. But the most accessible version, and the one I recommend, is the HD remaster for modern consoles and PC. This version overhauls the character models, adds some new costumes, touches up some of the lighting and backgrounds, and adds an optional new control scheme that ditches the tank controls. Though I don't recommend using this, because then you can just zip past zombies like Speedy Gonzalez, which obviously destroys the challenge of the game, but more on that later. Some of the backgrounds do look a little bit worse, and the black levels are slightly crushed compared to the GameCube release, but I don't think it's anything you're likely to notice unless they're shown side by side. Console versions are capped at 30fps, just like the GameCube, while the PC release runs at a full 60. 
I did have to download a file from the PC Gaming Wiki and change my refresh rate to 60 to fix some weird slowdown, but other than that I never had any issues. I also recommend changing the aspect ratio from widescreen to original. The widescreen option artificially fills the screen by zooming in on the backgrounds, and then when you run around the mansion you get this weird panning effect which can be quite distracting. So I strongly recommend changing it back to the original 4x3 mode. And that's about it. The Switch version has some pretty gnarly load times compared to all the other consoles, but other than that I say just grab whatever version is most convenient for you. Congratulations, I'm done rambling about ports and now you're ready to actually play the game. Like I said earlier in the video, for first time players I strongly recommend playing Jill's scenario first. She's got two extra inventory slots, a lockpick for certain doors, early access to a grenade launcher, and lastly, the helping hand of a Mr. Barry Burton. While she might be classified as the easy mode in Japan, first time players are still going to find a level of challenge and strategy missing from most modern games. So really it's more like normal mode for Jill's campaign, and hard mode for Chris's campaign. I really like the way they balance both characters too, because Chris certainly has his advantages over Jill, and if you're completely unfamiliar with this two character system, you can think of them more as two separate versions of the same story, each with its own unique characters, weapons and situations. Alright, if you're someone who's used to playing old games and has the patience to figure things out as they go along, then this is where we part ways. Have fun with the game, and I'll see you at Resident Evil Con 2024. But if that doesn't sound like you, and you think you might get a little lost or frustrated with the gameplay, stick around, because i got some spoiler free tips to help ease you into things. Jill! What's going on? Any clues? No, but something's wrong with this house. Whoa! This hall is dangerous! First up, let's address the panzer in the room here. Tank controls. Resident Evil 1 is an old game with fixed camera angles and a control scheme designed for a PlayStation D-pad. People love to make a big song and dance about tank controls, but it's a control scheme that makes perfect sense for the camera, and new players usually become well adjusted to it after some practice. Using the alternate control scheme from the HD version of Remake completely trivializes the enemies too, so please, don't use this. I get that tank controls can be disorienting and frustrating, but they do exist for a reason. And once you get the hang of them, you'll unlock the whole creepy cupboard of old horror games you always wished you could enjoy. Really the key thing here is to use a good d-pad instead of an analog stick. Your mileage may vary, but I find that using the d-pad for tank controls offers higher precision and a greater mental connection when steering your little shopping trolley around the mansion. Better watch where you're going though, or else a zombie might just wake up and take a munch out of your leg. How do you know when a zombie is actually dead? Easy. In the original game, a zombie only stops being a threat if you blasted their head off with the shotgun, blown them up with the grenade launcher, or shot them enough times that you can see a pool of blood around their corpse. So if you're trying to take them out with pistol shots to the body, wait until you see that blood oozing out of them. Pulling off a headshot with the shotgun is a reliable way to deal with them, and man, that animation just never gets old. But that's just the original game. And if you think you can get away with that kind of behavior in Remake, you're in big trouble, Buster. And that's because Remake features one of the sickest enemies to ever appear in a horror game, the Crimson Heads. Any zombie in the game which hasn't been blown up or had its head taken off will eventually mutate into these scary Freddy Kruegers who chase you around the room until you send them back to hell. They do a lot of damage and have a lot of health, so we really don't want to deal with these guys. And to top it all off, decapitating a zombie in Remake has a strong element of randomness to it. Getting close with the shotgun and aiming upwards certainly helps your chances, but it's not a sure thing like in the original. So if you've got a zombie on the ground and you know he's dead because he's bleeding out, how do we stop him from turning into a crimson head? Alright, you have to burn the bodies using a lighter and the kerosene from one of these tanks. If you do that, it's guaranteed the zombie won't turn into a crimson head. The catch is, there isn't nearly enough kerosene in the game to burn everybody in the mansion. Brilliant stuff. I love this mechanic, and it's probably my favourite part of Remake. It adds so much tension and strategy to moving around the mansion, to where playing the original without Crimson Heads actually makes things feel a little too easy. Crimson Heads can't go through doors like some zombies can, so there's no point using the kerosene in a room you're certain you won't go back to again. It's best to save it for areas you constantly need to access. And on that note, you really shouldn't be trying to kill every zombie or monster in the game. 
If you think you can reliably run past a certain zombie every single time, you probably should. It could save you a lot of ammo, and it stops them from turning into a crimson head in Remake. As a game that heavily focuses on the management of limited ammo and healing items, a lot of players get overwhelmed by this idea that they might suddenly run out of bullets and bugger themselves into a corner. But as long as you're exploring every nook and cranny like the game expects you to, it's much more forgiving than you'd think. Pistol clips are the most plentiful of the bunch, shotgun shells and grenade rounds should be conserved moderately, and finally, magnum rounds and acid grenades are best saved for bigger monsters and bosses. Those are my big tips for Resident Evil, but I'm sure once you get into the game, you'll start working out your own little strategies and methods to get the ghoulies off your back. The original Resident Evil, and its remake, is a game very dear to my heart. It's a perfect entry point into the world of horror games, and despite how much the genre has changed since then, this is still the peak of survival horror for me. It's one thing for a game to scare its player through visuals, audio, and storytelling. But for a game to actually give me a sweaty buck crack through gameplay mechanics alone, well, I think that's what the medium's all about. I hope you enjoy your time in the mansion, thanks for watching, and I'll see you when I see you.